I'm excited to welcome uh, David White. Obviously, we all know him. Um, we are very excited because, um, you know, it's funny the ebb and flow of our of our community, and I feel like Regenerative Ag has really um, r risen to the top of everyone's sort of um, attention and and to do lists. And I think whether it's spraying, it's 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 sea frogs work about the air and the toxicity, uh, and then we have this town hall meeting that's going to be really interesting next week of just already the rumbles of what's happening and. Uh, we've got some folks here that are spearheading that. So, uh, David, we're excited just to kind of talk about all of that regenerative ag, and uh, and David will kind of spearhead a, a, a conversation. We want to get your input, and hopefully you're all going to be going next week. And uh, anyway, let's give it up for Mr. David White. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Topa Topa Brewing, for hosting, and thanks for all you folks to come in. I know most of you, but if I don't know you, thanks for coming, too. Uh, I want to go through this slideshow. I got a bunch of slides, but I, I want to acknowledge that there is this thing at Chaparral at 7. So if there's something comes up, I'm more interested in having a conversation with you. I want to learn from you guys. All right, so I did get to garden in Scotland. This was the one sunny day in the 1960s. And... Uh, and I, I still go back to Scotland, and my old man is still there, and we go around uh, stone circles together. If you're interested in doing that, let me know. Uh, I went to university in Edinburgh. It's Everybody lives in a castle there. And I actually got to do some research at Cornell. Woohoo! I'm 25 in that one. And then I came to Ojai. Oh, and Ojai is very beautiful. And the thing about Ojai that really captured me first time was the Cespi. And I'm still on the board to keep the Cespi wild. And Kind of as an extension of that, I have a watershed education program that I run, and that is now um, through the Ventura Land Trust. And I am now an employee of the Ventura Land Trust as well as everything else. So watershed education seems really important, and everything that we do here relates to our watershed. So anyway, once upon a watershed, check it out. We're, we're super cool. Um, but really what I like to do and what I was trained to do was cell, cell biology and if you really want to know what type of cells I worked on, I, my PhD is in obstetrics and gynecology, and I can tell you a lot about that if you really want to know about it. But now I tend to look at soil biology, and that's with Nordoff. We extend this. This is our community soil testing workshops that we do. My buddy Bill Palmisano here leading this one down at the Grange. So folks can bring their soil samples and we can see what biology is in there. So a lot of what we do in terms of regenerative ag is about the biology in the soil. And the key thing about that is we're trying to increase the carbon content of our soil. And that's, that's, the, that's really where it's all at. Because, uh, let's see what's up next. Oh, there we go. How about that? A beautiful tree. And trees are amazing, right? They take in carbon dioxide and they pump it down into the ground. 40% of it, some of it goes to make their leaves and some of it goes to make their branches. But 40% of that CO2 out the atmosphere is going into the soil. And really what we're understanding more and more is about the biology of plant growth. And you know, oaks have been around here for uh, 100 million years, something like that. And chemical agriculture has been around since the 1940s. 40s. So, you know, returning to biological agriculture is really what we're talking about here. So moving away from chemical towards biological, that's what we're really trying to encourage. And I'll go through some of the things that we do about that. So partly uh, when we're interested in plants and what they do in the soil, it's about fungi. And fungi, we're learning more and more about this all the time. Um, 80% of plants have a fungal association with their roots, a mycorrhizal network. And when we are uh, dealing with, with uh, our perennials, we're trying to encourage uh, mycorrhizal associations like you have on this pine here. Um, this is a, this is a uh, close up of uh, our buscular mycorrhizae. This may be a bit much for you guys, but it looks like a tree. How about that? And it's increasing the ability of that plant to absorb nutrients from the soil. Um, and this is actually a, a fluorescent stain of a fungal hyphae, which is the body of a, of a fungus. And they hold together soil, and that's the key thing with uh, fungi and bacteria in your soil, is that they create the uh, soil particles that make healthy soil. When you're looking at healthy soil, what you want to see is black cottage cheese. You know, and it's got, it's got aggregates that are held together with, uh, with fungal hyphae and with bacteria. 
On the, the right there, that's a scanning electron micrograph of a, a soil pad, and it's being held together by fungal hyphae. And so when you do tillage, that's what you break up. And you, you're, when you've got these um, little particles of soil, that's how air can get into the soil, and that's how water can infiltrate. And if you're trying to work out the health of your own soil, an easy way to do it is to take uh, uh, some kind of, of stick or a rebar and poke it into the soil. And if you can push that into the soil easily, then you've probably got healthy soil. Another way to do it is just to see how quickly your water infiltrates into your soil. And if you pour a gallon of water onto the surface of soil and it stays on the surface, then you probably don't have very healthy soil. And if it, did, if it goes in very quickly, then healthy soil. And the thing that makes it healthy is carbon. And it's a win-win because we're taking that out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil. So that's really the, the rationale behind regenerative agriculture. Seems to make sense to me. Um, you know, so what are plants doing? They're pumping exudates right into the rhizosphere, this magical area where, which is right around the roots of plants. And the associations that form on those roots are where, this is where all the biology is getting fed by all these carbohydrates that are getting pumped out, right? Um, that, that is a root, uh, a, a root hair exuding carbohydrates. Yes, it's got a fluorescent tag on it. Yeah. Done in Dundee, actually. How about that? Um, and so, yeah, we've got lots of biology in the soil. Hopefully, this will work. There we go. This is, uh, uh, you know, it's amazing. I make these compost tea, and I make like 150 gallons at a time. And this is one drop. And there's a lot of biology in there. And all of these things are carbon-based life forms, right? And they're, they're, uh, they're eating, they're excreting, they're reproducing, they're dying, all in that root zone. And that's what feeds plants. So plants feed soil, soil feeds plants. That's biological agriculture. Um, and as you go up through the food web, right, we've got, we've got these bigger guys, and I love it. I'm not going to go into composting and how it composts here. If you want to find out more about that, you can ask me. We do a lot of different composting uh, work with worm bins and building compost piles, thermal piles. If you want more information about that, I've certainly got lots to share on that. But I didn't want to go into that to do too much depth in that today. But worms are our friends, and I, I love my worms. Uh, I don't want to give you too much text, but you know, in, in terms of what you can do to, to make healthy soils, least mechanical disturbance, right? We want to keep the roots in the ground as long as possible. So that points towards perennials, uh, agriculture based on trees, or just trees in general. We, they, they are going to feed the soil. If you're always tilling the soil, then you're breaking up all those aggregates, and you're returning the soil to the, the beginning of succession. So, and, and when you have those soils that are bacterially dominated, what happens is you get a lot of things that will uh, produce seeds very fast, like grasses. And people don't tend to like grasses, although they're great for the soil. Remember, every plant feeds the soil. Every plant. And I really think we need to get away from this concept of weeds. Because that, that is, is all plants are feeding the soil. And, and especially this urge to kill plants with pesticides, with, with poisons, I, I really, uh, it, it's kind of mind-boggling in a way. I've seen people where there's very little growing, spraying Roundup on tiny little plants. It's like, because they want a smooth surface with nothing on it. So a lot of it's about aesthetics. And really, we, we seem to be very, um, you know, challenged by having plants in the landscape that we didn't actually put there. What I think that we have with weeds is more of a seed shortage. So I encourage you, we've got, we really need support for um, pollinators, and I encourage you to spread seed right now is a good time to do it, to get seed, and, and Rincon Ron is here, Ron from Rincon Vitova, awesome local resource. Uh, Great seed mixes that will be fixing nitrogen in the soil and providing insectary support. Uh, you know, uh, really, I encourage you to check out Rincon Vitova's resources. Um, mulch and cover crops. How many of you have seen uh, The Biggest Little Farm? 
How many of you have seen that movie? A lot of you have seen that, right? And so th that was a film made over seven years, and that guy took almost four years to get his cover crops established. So keep on working at the cover crops. But he said the most important thing that he did in order to return fertility to that soil there was to plant cover crops. So keep on planting. Keep on putting seeds down. The next seed swap that we are organizing is going to be uh, first at the Patagonia store in Ventura on October 26th. And uh, we'll have seeds to give away, food seeds, simple things to grow. Ron will be there with his seed mixes. So come on down uh, Saturday, October 26th. Um, you know, the, the, we had John Liu came to town. I don't know how many of you got to, to spend time with him, but he was just, just amazing. And he had, he had uh, recorded the um, reforestation of lowest plateau in China. And basically, the three things that we had lost there was, was uh, uh, biomass, biodiversity, and accumulated soil matter, right? As accumulated soil organics. And those are the things that we need to build up, that we need to regenerate. So putting carbon back in the soil addresses one of those. If we plant trees, that addresses another. If we plant multiple types of trees, then you've got the diversity there. So uh, diversity, uh, biomass, and accumulated soil organic matter. Living root in the ground, that's the same thing. We don't want to till. We want to keep plants. Plants are great. They feed the soil. Um, and then the one that's a really a bit challenging for the homeowner is the animal impacts, is moving animals across the landscape. But it seems like holistic pasture management really is a successful way to uh, invigorate pastures. And the more and more that we can do grass-fed uh, animals, the better. And you know that represents about 2% of beef production in the US right now is, is pasture-managed, uh, grass-fed beef. Let's see what else I got here. Oh, yeah. Oh, did I say increase soil carbon content? I hope you got that one, right? So it's interesting to look when you see people uh, putting tons of, of their weeds into their uh, Harrison bin, the brown Harrison bin, and that getting trucked off. That is removing soil carbon content, right? When you uh, uh, cut down plants, you're removing soil carbon content. But if you're mulching, you're increasing soil carbon content, right? So think about what you're doing in your landscape, and is it increasing soil carbon content? That's what you want to do. So some things that you can help with, okay, no-till. You can chop and drop instead of removing uh, 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 organic matter from a site. You can leave it there. On contour will stop uh, water flow and allow it to infiltrate. You really don't want any water to leave your property, right? We want to, to recharge our groundwater. That's our main water source. Thank you, Paul, for wherever he is for emphasizing that. Um, so yeah, leave the leaves. That's why they're called leaves. Don't don't take them away, all right? Um, so I bung this in because we, we are running this program right now in Ohio and in Ventura. We've got a community uh, compost program. Jeff here has been uh, volunteering and bicycling around. It's actually a cycling compost collective. And if you, <laughs> yeah, Jeff, <laughs> eco-warrior of our town. And if you are interested in being part of that, if you're if you're a resident in the valley and you have compost and you don't have a way, way to deal with it, then what we're doing is we're taking it to the Ojai City Demonstration Garden and we're composting it there. And it's not hard, you know, compost happens, but we've got space there. And that garden was meant as a demonstration garden for composting. Um, we're also doing it in Ventura. We're picking up at the farmer's market downtown. And CRA is, is uh, funding some staff time for that. And we're coordinating volunteers for that too. So so if you're interested in helping out with uh, collecting of that, it happens on Sunday. I guess talk to talk to Jeff or talk to myself about that. Um, let's see. Oh, I like this one. So I make. Did I mention compost tea? I love making compost tea. So we we. The, it's all about the quality of the compost and really put a lot of effort into making good quality compost. But when you make compost tea out of it, what you've got is this. And this is liquid carbon. Right? We are putting liquid carbon onto the soil. And that every drop of that has biology in it that is going to make associations with the roots of your plants. So in terms of feeding your plants, that is a regenerative way to go. And it's interesting to think about how much uh, in agriculture is spent on fertilizers versus, uh, you know, chemical ag versus uh, how much it would cost to do uh, to make compost and to apply compost tea. 
So the the you know there's some research being done on it. We've done a bit of research on that. But you know the budgets of the chemical companies are a lot higher than ours. So it's a little bit challenging to do peer-reviewed work on that. But we may have time to show a wee video that shows some effects on that. Let's see. Oh, I had to put this in just because, you know, don't buy strawberries that aren't organic. It really is toxic. They're killing everything in the ground, everything in the air. And it also, you know, is really not good for the people who are doing it either. Um, so, yeah, don't do that. Uh, so this is sort of where I want to ask you guys. What do you think? Is this regenerative ag in the Ojai Valley? No? <laughs> well... It's, it's a beautiful picture, don't you think? But, you know, it is a monocrop, right? And you, I think you can see that it's the underneath that's been glyphosate, right? Because weeds are dangerous. We don't want them to feed the soil around our trees or something. I don't, I don't actually get it, but I know that people who are into uh, using glyphosate want to kill everything under their trees. And, and then, of course, we've got the Asian citrus psyllid. And this is a big issue for us in the valley. Um, and there is a meeting, I'll put a flyer up at the end, uh, next Saturday, and uh, it's 3 to 5 p.m., I think, at Matillaha. And so if you're interested in this, go, go along and, and you know, make your voice heard about what, what you think about uh, the spraying. Here we go, Jeff's got a town hall flyer there. The spraying of, of our crops for ACP. So it's, it's a challenge. And, and you know, I really want to... Uh, Embrace the citrus growers, especially those who have been here for generations, because it's their, uh, it's not just their industry, it's their identity. And they put a lot of work into this. And they support a method that just may now be passing beyond its time of use. You know, So it's interesting times for the citrus growers in the valley. Okay, yeah, there we go. Three to six on Saturday. I unfortunately won't be there, but CRA will have a booth. And you can sign up there for our uh, compost collection. So this is Mercer, right? This is beside Mercer. This is the boundary of the city. So this is unincorporated area, and and Mrs. Mercer took out her citrus, right? She didn't want to have to spray it. And the, the, the news is that it's going to be uh, commercial citrus. It's going to be industrial citrus. What's that? Lemons. Lemons. Okay. Uh, so not sure how that's going to be for the folks who are right along Mercer. You know, so uh, interesting. Apparently, he doesn't want to go organic because of the cost. Yeah, yeah. There's, you know, I talked to Chris. Bit, uh, he lives on Mercer. So, you got, and, you know, if you've got alternative ideas about this. But this is, you know, it's been tilled. It's been removed. This is back to, uh, you know, zero, basically. And there's a lot of things that could happen on there. Um, but right now, uh, you know, think about what this valley was like a 1,000 years ago. Can you imagine what it was just covered in oak trees, right? And so maybe I don't know. I would like to see oak woodland there myself. I just went and picked a whole bunch of ten ten minutes. I picked a couple of pounds of really nice acorns. So if you want to do some active regeneration right now, you could be picking and planting acorns. If you want to pick acorns and don't know what to do with them, we use them in our fourth grade program, Once Upon a Watershed. So what is this regenerative agriculture? Just add wa just add water. This is BD's place. Um, and annual uh, vegetables, right? So there's a lot of tilling goes on there. But he's organic, so it's a move up. It's a step up, I think, from uh, spraying uh, pesticides. Um, but you know, is there is the soil organic matter being built? Is there nitrogen fixing going on there that's not chemical dependent? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, this is uh, Poco Farm. This is Steel Acres. Is this regenerative agriculture? Well, it's annuals again. Uh, corn, I know, uh, takes a lot of uh, nitrogen to grow that. So I've been trying to work with Emily there to encourage the use of compost teas there. And in fact, we did do a little experiment there using compost tea. And this is Remington, one of our interns. Uh, we. Um, watered row crops over a couple of months and took soil samples and looked at the biology and then we weighed the crop when we harvested it and we showed an improvement in yield by the use of, of compost teas. So uh, have we published that yet? No, but you know, I, I don't have a lot of time. So I guess if you're interested in helping me publish this, the Journal of Applied Soil Science, let me know. Um, 
What about this? Is this organic? Is this uh, regenerative agriculture? This is an organic citrus ranch, uh, and I am spraying that with compost tea. That's actively aerated compost tea that I brewed, and it was a lot of fun. And the trees look a lot better now. I don't have a before and after. I put this together very quickly, actually. But this is this is, um, I think, moving a little bit towards regenerative ag. But still, we've got it's a monocrop, but there is you know life under these trees. So not everything is being killed there. But what about this? Is this, this might be a bit more what I think the future of regenerative ag is. And this is uh, Sarah Trudeau. Uh, this is at Hanuman Gardens right in the middle of town. Under their avocados, which have nitrogen-fixing trees planted, interplanted. And these are Tipuana Tipu, Pride of Bolivia. And you know, over every acre of soil on the planet, is 35,000 tons of nitrogen. And that is freely available if you use plants that can transform that into forms that plants will use. And that's why the nitrogen fixing cover crops are so important. You know, our be beans, peas, vetch, all that stuff. Native ones, ceanothus, redbud, those are also nitrogen fixers. But this is an experiment. And what happened was these trees were, were shading those avocados when we had that heat wave. Um, when it was, you know, like 118 in town, right? And these trees did not, this was after the heat wave, and you can see there's a little bit of loss, right? A little bit of burn, but they kept their fruit. Whereas next door, where it was just a, a conventional avocado orchard monocrop, the, the trees died back, they lost their fruit, they, and, and I don't think they bore fruit the next year either. So I think this might be an interesting thing to experiment with. And avocados are actually an understory uh, plant in their native area. So it kind of makes sense. This is Hanuman Gardens. It is on El Toro. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's uh, you know, interesting experiment. They also did a lot of uh, work to contour the land so that the water would uh, uh, infiltrate, right? And they had very little runoff. In fact, these uh, terraces filled with water and stayed with water for quite a while. Infiltrating. It went off. Oh, there, it came back. Okay, I'm back. Let's see what else we got. Oh, Kathy. I, I, like, I like this one. This was at the, um, uh, the climate strike the other day. And I think this just about says it all, you know. Um, I, I, yeah, and Chris is there too, <laughs> taking care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, planting trees—it really makes a lot of sense to me right now. We've got um, acorns galore, and is a good time to collect those. But I'm I'm working through CRA with California Relief to do uh, get tree planting from Prop 68 money through CAL FIRE, and that'll be for disadvantaged communities in uh, the west side of Ventura is what we're looking at there. Because right now, we are we have, CRA has a base at Ron's Rincon Vitova and Sectory, where we're making compost and compost tea. We've been doing that with volunteers from Patagonia, and we've been distributing it particularly to properties that suffered losses in the Thomas Fire. And that was kick-started by a grant from the Ojai Women's Fund, and I really want to put a big thank you to those guys. The Ojai Women's Fund, when they started, they funded me every year. And I put in, I put in a request this year for a native plant nursery for Matilaha Junior High and also for a compost in, enhance their composting program there. So we'll see if that makes any difference with regenerative ag there. Yes, sir. Right on, right on. We need we need more tree planting initiatives, and really, in, in terms of uh, galvanizing a community around tree planting, it's not just the tree planting through; it's the tree care afterwards. And you really have to think five years ahead: uh, how are we going to care these for these trees? So I'm working on that with Cal Relief, and it's Cal Fire Money Prop 68. So let's see what else we got here. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So the the question is, what's the fastest growing trees to use around here? And you know, the nitrogen fixing trees are probably a good bet. You know, so tipu tipu tree T I P U is a good one, and it it doesn't have any um, thorns, which I really like. For here, there you know, tipu may not be perfect. It might use a little bit water than some. It might uh, suffer if there's a severe frost. Yeah, Flora Gardens would be a good one. 
Y you know, I have some, so you could ask me about that. All right, let's see what else. Oh, so just about at the end here. Um, tree planting. How about I like planting trees at school, and this was when I was working with Food for Thought, and this, this to me is regenerative agriculture in action. So this was 2011 with Janice Duncan at Miners Oaks Elementary. We planted um, this uh, Pakistani mulberry, and we called it uh, Duncan in her honor. And and we have a little ceremony: trees need people, people need trees. Welcome, Duncan. Anyway, I I just wanted to. To do a quick thing, how much did I do there? Half an hour? Okay, okay, okay. So, anyway, uh, questions, I'd love them. But the question, I think, is how can we spread regenerative ag, maybe at a, from a policy level? And one of the things that we do have going is the Healthy Soils Program, which is uh, CDFA, and that, uh, the California Department of Food and Ag. And they are still empowered to say that healthy soils contain are, are, have increased carbon levels. So even under our current administration, we can still say that. And it's nothing to do with climate change, right? Or, or taking, car but it's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So the Healthy Soils Program is one initiative that actually does meet those specs. And I just talked to a citrus farmer in Visalia, the Central Valley, and he got uh, funded by them to take composted uh, cattle manure, which there's a lot of in the Central Valley, and apply it to his orchard. So um, not quite sure what that would look like or smell like, but they certainly did increase the soil carbon content with funding from the government. So there are programs that are like that. Ron, do you want to add? Yeah, yeah. So here's a thought. Um, in the context of the general plan update, we have suggested that we should have a uh, uh, fossil fuel extraction tax on uh, fossil fuels that are produced in the county. So that would help to, to um, mitigate for the uh, greenhouse gas that's uh, produced from, the, from burning that oil and natural gas. So um, that should go into a fund. And we're thinking, hey, wouldn't that be great to use that fund to, to pay farmers to move to regenerative um, methods. So if you think it's a good idea, talk to your, your uh, county supervisor and um, push the idea. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I, I, I want to add, I'll get, I see three hands up. Um, you know, looking for farms here that are doing regenerative ag, I, I was, the ones that came up for me were, were Poco Farm and East End Eden. And they have animals and they have diverse crops. How they're making their money primarily is with education. And so it's interesting to look at that concept of diversif diversity and diversifying because we need for farmers to diversify their income stream too. And so if you have multiple uh, streams, whether that's like uh, Apricot Lane Farm making movies about your, your ranch or having classes there uh, or having tours, those are other ways that you're making income. And I just don't think that monoculture citrus is going to create that much interest in tours, especially if it's not organic. Bioremediation ability of hemp. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know too much about that. I, I imagine that because it's a fiber plant, it would be able to extract stuff. I know that mustard is actually a very good bioremediator. And uh, we got a lot of that in the Ohio Meadows Preserve, that's for sure. Uh, and it's you know freely available for you if you want to collect the seed. But the hemp hemp and cannabis growers are a driver for regenerative ag. And I, I do... Hemp and cannabis growers are, re are drivers for regenerative ag. And I do work with uh, hemp growers and cannabis growers. We do, actually, I have a promo video, but I don't know if we're going to have time to watch that. But um, they don't want particularly in their, their growing medicine, right? And they don't want pesticide residues in that. And it's tested at production level. And the, the story I hear in Carpinteria is that associates in sectary who spray for uh, pests would not spray the avocado crops for thrips because the cannabis they were concerned the cannabis growers would sue them. And so there's an example of cannabis uh, of a change in agriculture that is moving away from chemical agriculture. Now, um, they still are, they're, they're very profit driven. I mean, that's what they're in it for, right? And it tends to be monoculture. And so there's going to be problems associated with that too. Singing Frogs Farm is the 
go to for regenerative annual growing. And they really do a lot about timing and planting without tilling, like no-till drills are, are widely available. And so Gabe Brown, who I briefly put up information about him, he, he grows in um, the, the northern climes in, in uh, I'm trying to remember which state he's in, but he, he, he is uh, championing regenerative ag techniques for the for the industrial farmer if you like so no till is one way that we can do that and and more intensive growing that's based on timing of crops and planting so that there's still cover on the ground and and leaving that uh, accumulated uh, plant matter on the ground cr crushing that and using that as a cover and then planting through that these are the sort of techniques that can allow us to do annual growing without resorting to just continually tilling but it's true that organic agriculture tends to till more because they're not using herbicides so that's one of the challenges with organic uh, annual growing but there are people who are working that singing frogs is the one that it's the most famous, yeah, and it's in Northern California. BD grows uh, his, he interplants his citrus, and it's in the act as a, so the question was, can you grow citrus with plants underneath it? And yes, is the answer. And he uses um, the citrus to, ex as a season extender for, uh, say, lettuces, it will reduce their bolting. They won't go to seed so quickly because they're somewhat in the shade. And then it will also uh, buffer temperature changes so that your basil will last a bit longer before it freezes. You know, So yes, you can interplant and, and uh, have an understory. And you know, the, the, the permaculture designers talk about uh, seven layers of the food forest, and you know the, the mushrooms and the root zone is part of it, but certainly uh, a shrub layer is important. A good one around here, I, I like the um, creeping thyme, which is a living uh, uh, plant cover, right? And it's medicinal, good for your sore throat and all of that stuff, but low growing. So there's a lot of different strategies that you can use, so yes, yeah, you can do that. The question is, can you touch on uh, um, financial incentives for transitioning from uh, in, uh, chemical ag to regenerative ag, something like that, yeah? Um, and again, I think the Healthy Soils Initiative is is one of those programs. But, you know, they're, they're somewhat few and far between, and I, I want to hear if there's any, somebody knows of a program that's more than that. Yeah. You can get for, for tangerines. For tangerines, it's easier to sell the fruit if it's organic than if it's not, and you can get better price. Yeah, the, what, what we found with um, organic avocados on the ranch I live is that, that they weren't nece it wasn't necessarily a better price, but it was a easier to sell. So easier, easier to sell is a better price, too. So, you know, there, there's more of a market for organic. Interestingly, our organic production is not growing as fast as the organic, the demand for organic, which means we're importing organics. But I think that the in financial incentives, and thank you, Jim, for that, the financial incentive is the consumer's dollar. And if you are buying organic, then I think that that's, you know, we, we have a certification program there. It's something to support. And I really think it's a good thing to buy organic. Is there, is there anything good about gophers? Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I have never actually eaten one, but uh, um, I, I hear they taste just like chicken. Um, but but uh, they aerate the soil, right? So the only, f the th only thing they also do is eat, your, eat the roots of your trees. They love figs, and they love artichokes. So it's a bit of a challenge to grow those and have gophers around. So... Uh, I think that's one of the things as a gardener, I certainly have tried a lot of ways of trapping gophers, and uh, the cinch trap is the winner for me. So yeah, sorry, I, I'm not sure about how to balance. You know, there is over at Matillaha Junior High, uh, or the Matillaha Middle School now, they have a schoolyard habitat, and it's a gopher preserve. So, so if you live trap your gophers, you can let them go there. <laughs> you can plant things that gophers don't eat, and uh, gopher purge, it's classic, they won't eat it. Uh, but you know.
if you go over to Oak Grove School and Jake Ainsworth's garden there, he, he used to have cages around his beds, and he took those off, and just anything that survived was what he grew. So they don't tend to eat rosemary. They don't like daffodils. They don't like onions. Um, so there, are, there, there is a palette of plants you can grow that, that they'll stay away from. But it, it wouldn't be figs and artichokes, I'll tell you that. Chris is totally interested in that, too. Uh, and you know, solar solar farming is making money, and you can you can grow things under them too. So, yeah, yeah, you know, all things. I think it's really up to our imagination and ingenuity to work out solutions that uh, can help. You know, like our local microgrid. You know, production of electricity here. Uh, we we need more solar, right? Anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming out. Thank you, thank you.